It is good to be with you tonight, and I hope you're doing well, and I'm looking forward to being with you again in person this coming Lord's Day morning. We had a great group come together this past Sunday, so I would continue to encourage you to get there early for class and sit down near the front, even if there are many seats open in the back. If you could have my view from the back right at the end of service, I think you'd understand that. But uh, right there on the front row, the first few rows, if at all possible, if you're willing to do that, we would appreciate that. But uh, we are working our way through 1 Timothy in the Bible class on Sunday morning. That's at 9.30. And then we hope to wrap up our study of the rich man and Lazarus. And that starts at 10.30 when we come together for worship. So hope to see you this Sunday for Bible class and worship at 9.30 and 10.30. Uh, tonight, we are continuing in our series of lessons on prophecy in the Bible. We're just hitting some of the highlights. We're doing an overview. And this is something that we're doing in between our study of Acts and our beginning of the study of the book of Genesis. So this study is something of a buffer between those rather large books. And we needed a, a little bit in between here. So something of a topical study. We have really focused on a verse-by-verse -verse study through the Bible over the past 22 years together with a very few exceptions on Wednesday night. I think we had one study of Islam. We had one study focusing on evangelism, another one maybe on how we got the Bible. But other than that, we've been doing a verse-by-verse -verse study. So this is one of those topical studies and to help keep us on track to give us a sense of direction and progress and purpose. We're putting a rough outline on the left side of the screen. We started with the basics a few weeks ago, defining a prophet as someone who's a spokesperson for another. We gave examples of Aaron being a prophet or spokesperson for Moses. And we're talking about God's prophets in this study. Not generically, but uh, the prophets sometimes had the ability to foretell the future. Not always, but some of them did. And then we looked at that rather large list of the prophets in the Bible, which is available on the church website under the Grow tab under Articles. So fourlakecoc.org, and then go to that Grow tab, uh, drop down to Articles, and that, uh, that article is there, that PDF file of all the prophets in the Bible. We then looked at some principles of predictive prophecy. It's more than good guesswork. As to the timing of it, it is specific. The fulfillment must be unaffected by the prophet, so it's not something that uh, the prophet can play a role in fulfilling directly. Uh, it has to be accurate, and then we also learn that prophecy itself is temporary, so it was designed in that way. We no longer have prophets in the church today. We then went on to look at some examples of prophecy on a national basis. We looked at Egypt and then Rome, and then we focused in on Babylon for most of that class. A couple weeks ago, we moved on with some prophecies about individuals. We spent a lot of time on Abraham and Isaac. We looked at Joseph. We looked at Jacob's prophecies concerning his sons as he gave that blessing to his children before he died. We looked at Joshua's prediction about whoever might dare to rebuild the city of Jericho, and we saw its uh, fulfillment in Hiel. And then we looked at Agabus in the book of Acts. Last week, we looked at some prophecies concerning God's kingdom, the church, and we learned that Psalm 2, Isaiah 2, Daniel 2, and Joel 2 are all fulfilled in Acts chapter 2. Well, tonight, we continue on with some prophecies about Jesus. And as you might be able to see on the screen, if you're joining us online, not on the phone like some of you are, but if you can see there on the screen, we're dividing this into two lessons, uh, maybe three, but at least two. So tonight we'll introduce this by looking at some prophecies concerning the Lord's birth. And then next week we'll think about his life, death, and resurrection. That is, if we can fit all those three in next week. But again, we may divide next week into two different, uh, two different lessons. Uh, even before we get to the Lord's birth, I want us to start tonight by going back to the very beginning. So this is almost pre-prophecy. This goes way, way back. And this is the earliest prophecy, the earliest prediction in any way concerning Jesus. It's found in Genesis chapter 3. So if you're joining us on the phone, you may want to meet us there. Genesis chapter 3, it's actually spoken by God to the serpent, which is kind of interesting that God is giving a prophecy or a prediction to the serpent. Well, God tells Adam not to eat the fruit. If you remember that, that's the one rule. Uh, the serpent then tempts Eve. Eve eats the fruit anyway. Eve tempts Adam to sin. Adam eats it as well, and then God confronts Adam. And at that point, Adam blames God for giving him the woman. She did it, kind of pointing at her. And God then delivers a series of curses, both to Adam and Eve, but also to the serpent. So Genesis 3.15 is spoken to the serpent, where God says, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed, he shall bruise you on the head, 
and you shall bruise him on the heel. Well, God then promises, he predicts that there would be ongoing conflict between Satan and the human race, doesn't he? That would be the descendants of Eve. And specifically concerning Eve's seed, God says that he shall bruise the serpent on the head and that the serpent would bruise him on the heel. And I would just note the use of the word he in this passage. So it's not just that all of Eve's descendants would bruise the serpent on the head, but there is one in particular who will do this. So he will do the bruising, a descendant of Eve, that is. And this same he will eventually be bruised on the heel. Well, this obviously wouldn't be fulfilled until many, many years in the future, but this is a reference to Jesus. And we'll kind of see this come into play as the Bible unfolds. Although Jesus would be bruised on the heel, which is a painful injury. I know some of you listening tonight have broken your ankle and that kind of thing. Incredibly painful. It is It is just awful. Uh, but in many cases, it's not permanent. It is not life-ending. We may put it that way. Well, the serpent, on the other hand, would receive a blow to the head, so bruised on the head. So Jesus would suffer in the crucifixion, but Satan would suffer more. He would suffer what we might describe as a mortal wound in the resurrection. So there is a difference between the two, but there would be this war going on between the descendants of Eve or the seed of Eve, ultimately Jesus and Satan himself represented here by the uh, serpent. Perhaps some of you have seen a rather famous painting or piece of artwork. I'm not sure what this is. Uh, almost looks like a colored pencil or something, in my opinion, but uh, I'm, no, I'm no artist. Uh, but there is this uh, piece of artwork, we would say, depicting this prophecy in Genesis 3.15. The artwork was made by someone at a monastery uh, over in Dubuque, Iowa. So not too far from here, about an hour and a half or so. And I looked it up online to try to track down the source, and they say that they are delighted that this image has spread on the internet. So they made it for a Christmas card years ago, and it's got out there, it's been shared and shared and shared. And so they are delighted that it's been shared. So I couldn't, I looked, I could not find the copyright information other than that statement on their website. So I, I hope they're okay with sharing this. It is an amazing piece of work. But notice Eve on the left, and notice she's holding the forbidden fruit. And notice if you look down at the bottom, she has the serpent wrapped around her ankle. So that is the, you know, bruising her or her descendant on the heel. And then notice at the same time, she is being comforted by Mary. Obviously with Jesus on board in this depiction of Mary. And you might also notice that Mary is standing on what? Notice she's standing on the serpent's head. And this is obviously based on Genesis 3.15, the first prophecy concerning the coming of Jesus. But what a contrast between these two women. Before we get to an overview of the other prophecies, I'd like to fast forward to some observations um, made by the apostles and then also by Jesus himself concerning the fulfillment of these prophecies. So before we get to the specifics, I think we would kind of, I would classify this as uh, by way of introduction. So we're not yet getting to the examples, uh, but we are, we're working our way there. Notice we'll start with John 5, verses 46 and 47. John 5, 46 and 47. So Jesus is speaking to the religious leaders, most likely the Pharisees. And he says, for if you believed Moses, you would believe me. For he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? Now remember, Moses wrote the first five books of the Old Testament, including this passage from Genesis 3 that we just read together a few moments ago. And so I share this here at the beginning to show or to illustrate that Jesus sees himself as the fulfillment of what Moses wrote. And we'll see this several times as we move through the actual prophecies that Jesus and the apostles saw him, that is Jesus as the fulfillment of what was written many hundreds of years earlier. Uh, we see another example of this as Jesus speaks to the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. That's over in Luke chapter 24. So if you have a Bible, you may want to turn there. We're just briefly hitting these. If you want to write that down, great. But uh, Emmaus, on the road to Emmaus there, um, Luke 24 uh, verses 25 through 27, and then for time's sake, we will skip down to verses 44 through 45. So, so we're not avoiding anything, you know, not that we're scared of those verses in the middle or anything like that. Uh, but just for time's sake, 25 through 27, and then 44 and 45. And he said to them, O foolish men, 
and slow of heart to believe in all the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. And then skipping down to Luke 24, 44. Now he said to them, These are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. Well, we'll get back to the next few verses after this next week with reference to his death and resurrection. But as we just start looking at these prophecies concerning Jesus, I'm hoping we note here that Jesus sees himself as the fulfillment of those things spoken by Moses and the prophets, which is, of course, where we're heading in just a moment. Um, we've got another reference to uh, prophecy from Peter, and this is, it's good to keep in mind with all prophecy, but notice this is what Peter says, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 19 through 21. 1 Peter 1, 19 through 21. So we have the prophetic word made more sure, to which you do well to pay attention, as to a lamp shining in a dark place, until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your hearts. But know this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. I would just note here, Peter reminds us in this passage that prophecy is not a matter of someone's private interpretation. In other words, we need to be very careful that we don't stretch those things that were first spoken by Moses and the prophets beyond what they were, uh, how they were originally intended to be applied. And so we need to pay attention to how the New Testament writers applied those prophecies. So we can't just take hundreds of verses from the Old Testament and say, well, that seems to apply to Jesus. Let's make it about Jesus. That's really not the way we need to be doing that. So we need to be careful in the way that we apply these things, that we apply them in the way that the Bible applies them. For an example of Peter applying these prophecies to Jesus, I want us to go back to Acts chapter 3. Uh, to the healing of the man who couldn't walk. Remember in the ABCs of Acts, this is the man who was carried and cured, which of course is a much better summary of chapter 3 than the old way. But uh, Peter addresses those who are gathered in the temple that day. And as I remember it, this formerly paralyzed man is still clinging to his feet. So the man is still there. It's very dramatic. It's an opportunity. It's a teachable moment. And so we come to kind of the, the second part of Peter's sermon in Acts chapter 3, as he says, But the things which God announced beforehand by the mouth of all the prophets, that his Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. Therefore, repent and return so that your sins may be wiped away, in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send Jesus, the Christ appointed for you, whom heaven must receive until the period of restoration of all things, about which... God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from ancient time. Moses said, The Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. To him you shall give heed to everything he says to you. And it will be that every soul that does not heed that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. And likewise, all the prophets who have spoken from Samuel and his successors onward also announce these days. It is you who are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with your father, saying to Abraham, And in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. For you first God raised up his servant and sent him to bless you by turning every one of you from your wicked ways. Again, that's Acts 3, verses 18 through 26. Uh, looking back over this passage, I would just emphasize how Peter's sermon, his message here, is based on Jesus being the fulfillment of prophecy. Notice that is that is his sermon. So this is the way that Peter preached. This is the way the other apostles preached, as we'll see throughout the book of Acts. In verse 18, he refers to the things which God announced beforehand by the mouth of all the prophets. He has thus fulfilled. In other words, this is what God said 1,400 years ago or 700 years ago or 500 years ago. And this is how we know that passage refers to Jesus. Um, he was opening the word of God and explaining how Jesus is the fulfillment of it. And notice in verses 21 and 22, he talks about all things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from ancient times. And he mentions the prophecy from Moses that the Lord God would raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. In verse 24, he refers to the fact that all the prophets who have spoken from Samuel and his successors onward also announce these days. And then in verse 25, he refers back to the promise made to Abraham 
that in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And so he takes a number of prophecies from Moses and the prophets, and he wraps all of this up in a rather brief lesson here, and he applies all of those prophecies to Jesus. And as I just mentioned briefly a few moments ago, this continues throughout the book of Acts. So Peter is not unique with this. This is how the apostles preached. Uh, we think of Peter's message to Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. In Acts 10, 42 and 43, Peter refers to God and he says, And he ordered us to preach to the people and solemnly to testify that this is the one who has been appointed by God as judge of the living and the dead. Of him all the prophets bear witness that through his name everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins. So notice the reference to the prophets there. He was saying these are prophecies that they made. Jesus is the fulfillment of those prophecies. I would point out that Paul does the same thing. In Acts 17, Paul comes to the city of Thessalonica up in Macedonia, northern Greece. And in Acts 17, 1, 2, and 3, the text says, Now when they had traveled through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And according to Paul's custom, he went to them and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and giving evidence that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, and saying, This Jesus whom I am proclaiming to you is the Christ. And so notice there the reference back to the prophecies that were made about Jesus. Not only that, but this was Paul's custom. So we have a record of what he spoke in Thessalonica, but this is the way he preached elsewhere. So when he showed up in uh, Philippi or Neapolis or any of those other places, this was Paul's pattern. He opened the word of God. This is what God predicted. This is what Moses said. This is what Isaiah said. And this is how all of this applies perfectly to Jesus. So we've looked at these passages first just to show that both Jesus and the apostles used the prophecies from Moses and from the prophets to prove that Jesus is the fulfillment of those prophecies. So it was an evangelistic tool, we might say. This was how they reached people with the gospel. Before we wrap it up tonight, let us take the rest of our class to look at some uh, very specific prophecies concerning the Lord's birth. And if you're able to see the screen there, we'll be starting with a prophecy concerning where Jesus would be born. So as to his location, this is Micah chapter 5 verse 2. Notice what Micah says, Micah 5 verse 2. But as for you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you one will go forth for me to be ruler in Israel. His goings forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. The prophet emphasizes then that some future ruler would be born in Bethlehem, doesn't he? And he emphasizes that Bethlehem is small. And you're, you're too little to be among the clans. You're, you're this tiny little village, so you're not a large city like Jerusalem. He makes a point of that, and that'll be significant in just a moment. But this Bethlehem, it's a tiny village. In spite of its small size, though, this great ruler would come from Bethlehem. And the prophet identifies this ruler as being one whose goings forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. The one to be born has pre-existed from the days of eternity, maybe one way of saying that. So this is not a normal ruler. This is not just some king who's going to be born at some point in Bethlehem. This is the king. This is the ruler who has roots going back to the days of eternity. So this is above and beyond. Well, the fulfillment of this prophecy, of course, is seen over in Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 6. And maybe I should insert this here. I was thinking as I was going through class earlier today that a lot of the explanation of these prophecies being fulfilled is found, they're found in Matthew. They're not really found too much in Mark, Luke, and John. A vast majority of these where the Bible writers say this is what was predicted Almost all of those in the gospel accounts go back to Matthew. And I'm not saying exclusively, I'm just saying there's a heavy emphasis in Matthew on prophecy. Well, we would ask, why is that? Well, if you remember from us studying the gospel accounts, Matthew was written to the Jewish people. In fact, a lot of people think Matthew was kind of a, a textbook for the early church. So their Sunday morning 930 Bible class, when they would whip out the book, it was Matthew. Matthew wrote that. That's kind of the theory on Matthew, that it was written for the church in Jerusalem so they could teach the group without necessarily having an apostle right there in person. 
Okay, so Mark was written to the Romans, Luke was primarily to the Greeks, John was kind of, he's off on his own, not written until decades later, the 80s or maybe the 90s. But I'm just saying there's an emphasis in Matthew because Matthew's audience kind of cared about that. If they were Jewish, they knew the old law, they knew Moses, they knew the prophets. Mark's audience, not so much. A bunch of Romans, they don't really care. I guess, you know, don't want to be disrespectful there, but I, but I think that's the truth. And so Mark has a different focus, and he's focused on action. Jesus did this, and he went here, and immediately, and this and that. And it's just going, 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 going. And almost the same Luke has his own emphasis there. But I'm just saying Matthew, written primarily to the Jewish people, that would explain by why a lot of these explanations of the prophecies are found in Matthew. So back to Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 6. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. Gathering together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for this is what has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah. For out of you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Well, I would point out here that this is the perfect fulfillment of prophecy, isn't it? You know, this isn't us coming up with this after the fact and saying, oh, look, there's this obscure verse, and sure, it applies to Jesus. Let's just say it does. You know, that's that's not uh, it's not a matter of us just kind of forcing things to fit together. No, this is Matthew, an inspired apostle. He's writing this down, and he's telling us that the chief priest and the scribes, that would be Jesus' enemies, were saying that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. I hope we catch what's going on there. So this isn't even just Matthew saying it. He's recording it accurately. But if you were to ask a religious leader and have them write a term paper or whatever, some proving kind of paper back in the early or mid-20s AD, where would the Messiah be born? They would do their research, and their conclusion here is Bethlehem. Because obviously Micah says that the Messiah would be born in the village of Bethlehem. So I'm just saying that uh, we have here this note from Matthew, that Jesus being born in Bethlehem is the fulfillment of prophecy. And I would also point out that this prophecy also has a very practical application today. The prophets predicted that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem. The Book of Mormon, though, says that Jesus would be born in Jerusalem. And if you have a screen, if you're watching this class tonight, you'll notice the second quote on the screen here is from Alma. 7 verse 10, which is found in the Book of Mormon. And Alma's, uh, Alma 7 10 says this, And behold, he shall be born of Mary at Jerusalem, which is the land of our forefathers, she being a virgin, a precious and chosen vessel, who shall be overshadowed and conceived by the power of the Holy Ghost, and bring forth a son, yea, even the Son of God. Well, I share this not just to pick on another religious group, and I wait, I don't want to go down that path where, yeah, look at those people kind of thing, but there are times, as we had to do this past Sunday, but there are times when we have to uh, do this to make a point based on the verse that we're actually studying, and tonight we're emphasizing the importance of prophecy. If a prophecy is wrong, if a prophet gets it wrong, the whole book is wrong. It, you can't trust any of it. And so if, you know, if Micah had predicted that this king would be born in Babylon, well, he would have gotten it wrong, and, and we wouldn't believe the whole whole book here. But that's not what happens. And so um, this is absolutely the case with the Book of Mormon. They got it wrong on this one. And when you make up something claiming to be a religious document, and if it's not something that God is involved in guiding, um, certainly there are many opportunities to make mistakes, and this is one of several in that document. Um, I've spoken to a number of so-called elders standing on my front porch, and they come, they want to talk, and I'll say, well, you know, where was Jesus born? And they'll say, well, obviously Bethlehem. 
And I'll ask them to turn together to Alma chapter 7, verse 10, and then we'll go into this discussion of this. Because we really don't need to go any, any beyond that. If, if I can't trust your book, if the book itself can be proven wrong, I, I don't need to listen to anything else that you have to say. And uh, when they've tried to explain it, uh, the ones who um, have gotten that far with me, they, they've said, um, I remember one young man said that uh, Bethlehem is a suburb of Jerusalem. And, and my response is, well, so what if it is? Uh, Jerusalem is not Bethlehem. And so they need to decide, don't they? Where was Jesus born? Was he born in Bethlehem or was he born in Jerusalem? If he was born in Bethlehem, the Bible is right. But if he was born in Jerusalem, then the Book of Mormon is right. And they cannot both be right. And I'm just saying this is a key verse to keep in mind. Alma 7 verse 10. With this discrepancy, we need to decide between them. I can go with Micah or I can go with the Book of Alma. We cannot believe that both documents are inspired because Jesus could not have been born in both places. And my encouragement to the young elders, so-called elders standing on my front porch has been don't go to another door until you figure this out because you need to know whether your book is true or false and here we here we have it so that's just something for us to keep in mind based on prophecy and that's one example of prophecy being very relevant uh, doing the best i can to keep this in uh, some kind of order let's look at the one of the most famous prophecies concerning the coming of jesus and this one it being found back in isaiah chapter 7 verse 14. isaiah 7 14 this is where isaiah says Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. That is rather significant, isn't it? That, that is absolutely huge. I mean, obviously, it's not every day that a virgin bears a son. And on top of that, we are also given the child's name. He will be called Emmanuel. And obviously, this is a sign, so this is something that would be out of the ordinary. And we'll get back to that in just a moment. So we then turn to the fulfillment of this. And notice again, we have another Matthew passage. So Matthew 1, verses 18 through 25. Matthew 1, 18 through 25. This is one of those paragraphs. We used to have memory verses when I went to college. And at that time... Every student on campus had to take one Bible class, and at that time there were 75 memory verses. So it was up to the professor what those verses would be. And I hated it when a professor would give like one or two verses here and there scattered through the book of Hebrews. Well, the, the teacher who taught me Matthew uh, was merciful, I think very wise, in giving us just a few chunks. And this is one of those chunks. And so if you're going to memorize a chunk of scripture as opposed to random verses everywhere, this is a good chunk to memorize. But this is Matthew 1, 18 through 25. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, planned to send her away secretly. But when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. And Joseph awoke from his sleep and did as the angel of the Lord commanded him, and took Mary as his wife, but kept her a virgin until she gave birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Well, there's been some discussion, as some of you are aware, as to the translation of the word virgin back in Isaiah, whether it simply refers to a young woman or whether it refers to a virgin virgin, I guess, as we would understand the word today. But I find it interesting, although we could have a long discussion on that word and how it's translated in Hebrew, I find it interesting that when Matthew writes this quote in Greek, he uses the word for virgin, indicating that this is clearly miraculous. So he did not say young maiden, young woman, anything like that, but he uses the Greek word for virgin. 
uh, indicating that this is absolutely clearly miraculous and that the uh, birth of Jesus is a clear fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy. And I would just note again, uh, Matthew is the one who explains this for us, isn't he? And that is significant here. Uh, again, very roughly in chronological order as far as the fulfillment goes, the next prophecy that is kind of interesting comes in Hosea 11 verse 1, where God says, When Israel was a youth, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. Well, on its own, that, that doesn't seem to be very significant. You think, oh, that's kind of, kind of interesting. We could maybe see a connection here until we get to the actual fulfillment. And uh, over in Matthew 2, verses 13 through 15, Matthew refers back to the wise men leaving King Herod, uh, very close to where we were just a few moments ago. And this is what Matthew says. Now, when they had gone, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to destroy him. So Joseph got up and took the child and his mother while it was still night and left for Egypt. He remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Out of Egypt I called my son. So again, back in Hosea 11.1, 1, the prophecy might not have seemed too much like a prophecy at the time. It's not something you would ooh and ah over. Be, oh, that's an interesting statement though. But notice Matthew very clearly applies it to Jesus. In some sense, Jesus was to be called out of Egypt to fulfill this prophecy. Well, obviously, Jesus wasn't born in Egypt. We established that already tonight. He was born in Bethlehem, just outside of Jerusalem. And so he gets there down to Egypt due to a threat from King Herod. So he's taken to Egypt for safety. And God then calls him back once it is safe. So calling him out of Egypt, which is a direct fulfillment of Hosea's prophecy. Uh, tied to this, if we continue in Matthew 2, we'll get to another prophecy that comes from Jeremiah 31, 15. And Matthew's on a roll. I mean, it's one prophecy after another in the first few chapters here. He's explaining who Jesus is and why we as Jewish people, his audience, should, should listen to him. So this is one that goes back to Jeremiah 31, 15. Thus says the Lord, a voice is heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping. Rachel is weeping for her children. She refuses to be comforted for her children because they are no more. Well, this fulfillment, of course, comes, unfortunately, in Matthew 2, verses 16 through 18. Matthew 2, 16 through 18. Then when Herod saw that he had been tricked by the Magi, he became very enraged and sent and slew all the male children who were in Bethlehem and all its vicinity, from two years old and under, according to the time which he had determined from the Magi. Then what had been spoken through Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and she refused to be comforted because they were no more. Well, Matthew then, inspired by God, he applies Jeremiah's prophecy to what happens with Jesus, with Herod's murder of the children. And I would point out here, God does not cause the deaths of these children, not at all, but he could see it coming. And so he told us about it in order to help further uh, cement this truth that Jesus really is the fulfillment of all of this. There are other prophecies that uh, we could have looked at tonight. We could have gone much more in depth on those that we have considered. I mean, we could study this for months if we wanted to do that, but we're just doing an overview here, just hitting some of the highlights. Tonight, by way of introduction, we've looked at the big prophecy, the first prophecy of all time back in Genesis 3.15. We've looked at how Jesus and the apostles use these prophecies to prove that Jesus is who he claims to be. And then we started with some examples that are tied to Jesus' arrival on this earth. The place of his birth, the fact that he was born to a virgin, the fact that he was called out of Egypt, the fact that many children were murdered at the time of his birth. And all of these things were predicted. They were fulfilled perfectly, absolutely proving that Jesus is, in fact, the Son of God. Again, if the Lord wills, we hope to continue next Wednesday by continuing to look at some prophecies concerning Jesus. As I said earlier, if we need to, we may need to split into the next two weeks to cover all of that. Uh, but this is where we are headed. So we plan on looking next week at some prophecies concerning Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. So tonight was the introduction of Jesus' prophecies. We've looked at his arrival, his birth, 
And next week and perhaps the following week, we'll look at quite a bit that's said in the Old Testament and the prophets concerning his life, death, and resurrection. Again, I hope to see you this coming Sunday, 9.30 for class and then 10.30 for worship. And as we close tonight, let's go to God in prayer together. Our Father in heaven, once again, we recognize you tonight as being the great and awesome God, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things which have not been done. We look at what your servants, the prophets, have written, and we know that Jesus truly is your Son, the Messiah. By inspiration, they could see his arrival coming on the distant horizon, and they wrote what you revealed. We realize now that this was for our benefit, and we are so thankful for that. Father, you know that we live in troubling times, in violent and evil times. We pray, therefore, tonight for peace. We pray for safety, especially for the safety of your people. We pray that you would give us, as your people, opportunities to serve. We pray that you would give us opportunities to reflect your light to the very dark world around us. We ask a special blessing tonight on those who are facing special health challenges. You know exactly who they are and what they're going through. And we also ask you to bless their caretakers. We come to you tonight in the name of Jesus the Messiah our shepherd and our king. Amen.